It's been a, a wonderful season of poetry, spoken word, and song. Uh, I've loved every bit of it. The features that we've had, as well as the open mic participants. And as soon as this program ends, I'm going to get busy and look at the last two seasons and make sure that I have all of the names of participants on the shows for that month um, listed so um, that I'll be able to let people know uh, what months that they've been on and also to know where to uh, see uh, your uh, performance online because our last two seasons of show are online at our website. When I came back to poetry as an adult after about a 23-year hiatus, 23 hiatus um, I came back to creative writing through stand-up comedy first, and that wasn't quite the right path, as I've mentioned before. And then I was sent to folk music and poetry venues to read humorisms. And from that mix of the two, uh, I started writing poetry and then got invited to share it to music. And that has been my uh, favorite way of hearing and sharing poetry and music together. And to my delight, this is what has evolved at this program, Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, that we have the mix of poets and songwriters and spoken word artists, and we have collaboration, and sometimes we have had uh, poets inspiring songs and vice versa here. And we have that happening today. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, announce we have a mix of poetry and song and the collaboration of the two with our features, Hopkinton poet Peter Legoy, and singer-songwriter and poet David Daniel, and singer-songwriter Susan Cataneo. So I'm excited about this program. We will go into open mic, as I mentioned, right after our features. And uh, we've got a big uh, morning prepared. So let us begin. Right, Peter? <laughs> Okay. So, in starting with this morning's features, I'd like to begin with Hopkinton resident and poet Peter Legoy. Peter grew up in Northwest Connecticut and spent his time as a boy hiking in the woods and chasing and studying frogs and grew up uh, to continue studying uh, things like frogs and the outdoors as he went into 30 years a uh, profession of health risk assessment and he evaluates health effects of chemicals at hazardous waste sites. He's also a father and uh, most recently of a, a new graduate of Hopkinton High School. And Peter has been writing poetry as well as publications related to his work, such as How Much Dirt Do Kids Eat? and <laughs> What's a Safe Level of Lead in Soil in Aspen, Colorado? and a publication of the book Risk Assessment. And he's also traveled a lot across the country in Europe, Brazil, Yemen. And uh, Peter noted, one of my most interesting trips was to Johnston Island, the man-made US island used to store Agent Orange for nuclear testing and for the chemical weapons destruction. A beautiful place with a ghastly use. So uh, when Peter is not uh, studying uh, what is chemically wrong and harmful in our world, he does have some time to run and kayak and write poetry. And when I asked Peter what inspires him to write poetry, Peter said, I find life interesting. While there's certainly lots of things we do that are uninteresting, there are also each day numerous inspirational moments. Writing poetry or even just thinking about poetry helps me to focus on those inspirational moments rather than on the daily chores. Capturing these moments is the reason I write. It's nice to look back at a poem and remember the associated moment, a moment that would generally be lost to memory without the recording. So here to share some of his moments with us this morning is Peter Legoy. Please help me welcome him. As Cheryl mentioned, I started writing to store memories as I appear to be operating a 286 machine with a couple megs of memory and our world is basically a gigabyte type world so I needed to write things down in order to remember where I've been, what I've done. Started writing mostly about my youth but then I and was writing in prose and then switched to poetry to capture sort of more current events. Um, 
I was realizing you run into, as I mentioned, a lot of interesting little events that you forget about if you don't write them down. And as was also mentioned, it's, it's nice in the process of thinking about possibly capturing some of these events, it sort of increases your ability to be attuned to what's going on around you, or at least that's how it works for me. My process for writing then involves seeing or hearing, thinking about some moment, whether it's something interesting the person in the car I'm riding beside is doing or how that person relates to me, something I see when I'm out on a run in the woods, um, or just something the kids do. And then usually what happens is I'll get a line from that moment and then I try to think about sort of let my mind wander and I, I follow and, and develop the poem, the basis for the poem from that. Um, I've got a bit of a Catholic upbringing and as those of you who are Catholic or Jewish know that guilt is an important part of our development. <laughs> and so from that, what, what that means is that I can't just write something, I have to write something and then have a message afterwards. So you'll see most of my poems start with something and then end up with some sort of message coming out of it. That's where I end up going. Of course, once I've got that all captured, then I have to go home. And as you know, that those of you who write poetry, that's when the real work starts and you work and rework and rework to get something that hopefully is a finished, to the extent anything ever can be finished, product. I'd like to share a mix of poems today um, addressing kids, family, nature, and various odd events. I'm also including sort of a short prose piece from some of my earlier writing. This first poem is kind of self-explanatory, and again, it's just focused on capturing one of those moments. It's called Ice Cream After Camp's First Day. There's something about a five-year-old kid in ice cream. Well, really soft serve. Or ice milk, depending on where in the country you're from. But whatever you call it, a five-year-old with ice cream is special. At five years old, they're old enough to pay attention to drips, so they sit with legs apart so drips can fall between legs, and they know to lick around the edges of the cone, limiting drips, although they're not as good at this as their parents. I sit today with my five-year-old as he eats a soft-serve cone. Probably too much ice cream in the cone for him. He's somewhat overwhelmed, but eats on. The cone, a celebration of his first camp day, a day that went well, but a day that had him dozing as we drove to Dairy Queen. Too tired to recite all that had happened, but asking for lyrics of a song he hummed at camp to start the day. He sits quietly, happily, eating ice cream. And I sit, watching him, enjoying the sun and the day and this time. We'll head home. He'll fight to watch TV or to stay up past bedtime or for one more story. I'll be impatient with his slow progress in the bath and with his dislike of a hair wash and will clash. But at this moment, life is wonderful for him and for me and for us. Thanks. One of my favorite poets is Carl Sandburg. I like his sort of simple style. One of his lesser known poems, Happiness, is one of my favorites and is the basis for this poem. This is a poem that I use at our family gatherings um, pretty consistently. So my parents and have heard that poem many times. For Sandberg, they were Hungarians. On the beaches of Hopkinton, the immigrants are mostly Brazilians and Russians, with a smattering of Indians and Japanese. But the image is the same as that poem's name, happiness. The Brazilians dominate the picnic tables and the grills, and consequently the scents wafting to my nose are primarily Brazilian grill, roasting chicken and meats, scents that stir the common soul. The sounds as they run by are also universal, the laughter of children and adults, and the sights too, a soccer game, groups of lounging peers, and couples walking hand in hand. Happiness in this foreign land. And we, the natives, swim isolated in backyard pools and see psychiatrists 
and wonder how we will ever achieve happiness. I've lived downtown in Hopkinton for some time, and you become aware of your neighbors and of the local foot traffic that goes by. Um, you see the same people walking, sunny days, rainy days, snowy days, they're walking their loop, and they'll do it forever. And you notice changes in the neighborhoods too, and trends. When I wrote this poem about a trend that I saw, a trend that actually I was part of at one, at one point. It's called Uncertain Change. They appear around town in small packs, new occupants of the downtown rental property. A parent, usually a father, and some kids. The kids, initially boisterous, exploring new settings, excited. Unless older, they get it. They've had friends down this path, they're scared. The parent, somewhat shell-shocked, but making the best of the situation. Let's get some pizza, maybe some ice cream. These new actions add to the excitement of new part-time home, new surroundings, a focused time with just this parent. All designed to fill the void, the huge hole punched in the heart by the divorce talk. Moving to something a little lighter. <laughs> <laughs> this next is one of those short poems that kind of comes from an incongruous meeting of a couple of uh, elements. And it was written in the spring, but it applies pretty much to any spring as well. It's called Fly. The large black fly sat on the window, one of a troop of such that have invaded over the past week, coming in ones and twos. They bother, but seem to do no real harm. I looked for a weapon to end its life, and what came to hand was a small pamphlet titled Acceptance. <laughs> the fly lives. Good to see you. This is the intro to that poem, which is, we basically toss off greetings on a regular basis. You walk by your coworker, you say, how are you doing? And you're not really asking how are you doing, you're sort of saying, hi, how are you? But sometimes those sort of cliched greetings have some real meaning, particularly if we delve down into them. And I had an event last summer that kind of brought one of those home to me. This is entitled, Good to See You. Good to see you has new meaning when spoken on leaving to a father being treated for cancer. This typically tossed off statement used alternatively with, see you later, thanks for having us, has now a second meaning, a core meaning. Good to see you. Meaning still, it was nice to visit, but now including more. Good to see you, now meaning, glad the chemo's not hitting you too hard. Nice to see you're still smiling. Happy you're out puttering in the garden. And yes, most importantly, good to see you. Meaning simply, glad you're still with us. This last, a new thought. All children, whatever age, expect immortality of parents. Illness, a reminder that parental immortality, a childhood fantasy, like unicorns. The illness, a message, the word spoken, a wake-up call, imposing adult reality on childhood fantasy, but also a reminder to fully enjoy this time with this person and others, and to embrace the core meaning of good to see you. I want to move into sort of a, a short prose snippet, partially involving the same person. We always had used cars growing up. Um, and if you get our family together and we start talking cars, that's when you hear us oftentimes laughing the loudest for those who are at my age bracket. My father, on the other hand, will sit there and vainly defend his choice of cars and pretend that the problems weren't quite as bad as we realized them to be. However, this story isn't about a car problem. My brother, in his senior year of high school, decided that a convertible would be more in keeping with his status as class president. 
given that purchasing such a vehicle was out of the question, he petitioned my father to let him remove the top of the old blue VW, <laughs> which met with the predictable no answer, which fell on deaf ears. My brother, working carefully at times when he could not be caught by my father, cut off the top of the car being careful to cut close to the edge so that once the roof was reattached, rain would not run into the car. The roof was held on with four bolts and was not too noticeably different when viewed from a distance. As the car was parked under an apple tree away from my father's path to the house from his car, it escaped detection, at least for a time. I was home from college for the unveiling. My brother, proud to show off his new creation, waited until my parents had gone off together and then offered to drive me to the mall in Farmington. He took off the roof, leaving it under the tree, and we headed out. The car was exciting, conversation was fun, and we were both in good moods as we tooled down the road. On the uphill straight past where the old Canton Golf Club used to be, we met our parents returning from their excursion, and Ned, my brother, waved to them with his right hand thrust skyward through the open roof. My father, taken aback, but probably doing the mental math on the value of the car and what this, in the limited effect this alteration would have on that, could only smile. My brother, my brother, realizing a bit too late what he'd done, and of course, knowing the usual outcome of defying a direct order, was subdued for a time. But the day was too nice, and we were soon laughing about the look on all faces in response to his exuberant salute through a roof that was supposed to be there, but wasn't. Yep. I have a poem that I was going to read, but then with my, you know, not being able to run, I'll leave it. But just as a piece of trivia that I think it's important that you all know, I put together a marathon exhibit in Hopkinton. One of the things I do is in, be involved in town things. And because I like poetry, I pretty much add poetry to every exhibit I put together. So, you know, we have a running exhibit, marathon exhibit with poems. But it was interesting because in that process, what I found out was that Robert Browning wrote a poem entitled Phidippides about the original marathon. And that when he wrote that poem in the late 1800s, it was provided the impetus for the Greeks to decide they ought to maybe try one, running one of these races again. So basically, poetry is directly responsible for the rekindling of the marathon. So feel free to use that however you want. If you've got friends who are marathoners and they start talking about their marathon, you can say, hey, you wouldn't have your sport without us. So that's all I'll say about that poem. But This poem, which I've shared here before, is a favorite of mine and one I keep going back to to remind myself basically to take life a little less seriously. It's entitled Laundry of Love. You exult in the freedom of shirt peeled, turned inside out, and tossed to laundry. I crave the efficiency in future folding of shirt left inside in, and so we struggle. Or I struggle, as you seem not to care. Leave it inside out when you fold it, says you, as if it's that simple. To not turn it inside in is to say I don't care, or that I care less. So I reach down sleeve and pull and repeat until it's right and then folds, complaining inwardly. And sometimes in protest and just to show you the error of your ways, I leave a couple inside out, there. <laughs> But mostly, I just pull inside out to inside in, mundane chore made slower, cramping my yearning for efficiency in respect for the exuberance of you, and maybe, just maybe, realizing in this difference the value of that exuberance over engineered efficiency. This last poem I wrote quite some time ago, and it's one, I, again, I go back to regularly as a reminder that while adventure can include travel, and often does when we're lucky, there's still lots to be seen and done 
very close to home. It's entitled Small Bridge. On the way home, I cross a small bridge over the railroad tracks. Looking left and right down the long tracks, no trains, just endless possibilities. To left, straight tracks to the Atlantic, stretching to continents and oceans beyond, forever sea to endless possibilities. To right, tracks stretching to Worcester, then west and south and north, intertwining labyrinth covering the spaces of America, thousands of miles and millions of people, billions, endless possibilities. I cross the small bridge, I drive to my house, I pick up the kids and I think, life here is quieter than the ocean, less expansive than the west, but still, the possibilities, endless. Thank you. And now for the second part of our feature, we have uh, the collaboration of song and poetry. And uh, we have David Daniel and Susan Catania. And David was a feature here back in November. And we, there was a problem with the footage. And he very kindly agreed to come back uh, once again. And uh, it is a double pleasure to have David invite Susan uh, to join him today. Uh, so very happy and looking forward to this uh, feature of poetry and song. Uh, a few words about Susan. Um, Susan was raised in New Jersey, and she found her music at a table with her family where they had six-part harmony together uh, during dinner time. She played in bands and she sang at piano bars in Italy and then returned to New York City where she had a dual career as a TV producer and writer, earned an Emmy nomination and New York State Broadcaster Award and at night she'd be in a funk folk band called Blackfish Band and uh, then went on to study songwriting at Berkeley and was invited to be on the faculty there teaching songwriting, and, which she does now and raising two children and writes and records in Nashville. And she has a CD titled Brave and Wild and have some today uh, over there available, which has been getting some wonderful reviews out there, including Boston Globe saying that Susan displays some serious girl power on her tough and tuneful new album. And uh, Susan also was asked about uh, the importance of songwriting and said, uh, the muse doesn't always strike. How do you generate that creative idea when you don't have it? I think if you have the tools to generate ideas, you'll find your muse. If you want fame, that's great. That's the icing on the cake, but you really should be writing songs and making your music because you want to finesse your craft and because you have a message to deliver to the world. And David Daniel. Uh, thank you again for your return. And David was teaching over at Emerson and was the editor for Plowshares Journal. And uh, he has, let me just organize here. He has a full length collection of his poetry, Seven Star Bird. And he has a new book as well that has uh, received a number of honors and he has a number of his uh, poems and essays in journals and uh, books out there. David is also a songwriter in addition to a poet and a teacher and he's been on tour with his book and his music and he's written songs for artists ranging from Shirley Basie to Cold Truth. And now David is uh, over at Fairleigh Dickinson University where he uh, is a director of the creative writing program and teaching over there, and also where he is co-poetry editor of the New Literary Review and the founder of WAMFest. And WAMFest is uh, very exciting as a celebration of songwriting, poetry, and the arts, featuring guests as Roseanne Cash, John Leslie Hardy, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Paul Muldoon, Robert Pinsky, and he'll tell you more about that later. Um, 
and what the goal, primary goal of this organization is celebration of poetry, songwriting, and the arts to break down barriers between high and low art that have led to the marginalization of poetry and literature in society and to the marginalization of popular arts in education. And there are some great quotes on the WAMFest website, so check that out. But for now, I'm very excited and honored to introduce to you Susan Catania and David Daniel. Help me welcome them. Sure. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Um, so uh, as a teacher at Berkeley, we have a lot of visiting artists come in. And last year, um, Paul Simon was our visiting artist. And I remember sitting in a clinic with him. And a student came up and said, can I please play a song for you? And he's like, sure. And he handed her his guitar. And she said, oh, I can't accompany myself. I have it on CD. <laughs> and he's like, you're a singer-songwriter, and you should be able to accompany yourself on guitar. And I do not accompany myself on guitar, but that really resonated with me. And so, y'all, you are my <laughs> third time that I will be accompanying myself on guitar. So um, I, I do not profess to be a great guitarist, but I'm earnest about it, and I've been working on it really hard. So bear with me if there are various clams in, in the song. They're all meant to be there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tune while we're here just to yeah. make sure I'm well, there. At least Susan can sing. I'm going to not play and not be able to sing. It's, it's, a, <laughs> so it's we, all good. Our guitar player ditched us. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It, it's, it was time. It was time to take the plunge yeah, so we'll do on our television. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this song I wrote with my friend uh, uh, Kristen Cefeli, who is a local folk performer, and we were just having fun, trying to think of a way, how do you write a song for someone you love? So this is called Red Light Kiss. Oh, yeah, I have to turn off the tuner, don't I? Thank you. See, that'll be helpful. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three, four.
<laughs> Thank Sorry you. So, um, I have two kids who are now eight and ten. But when they came out of the world into the world, they were they were like owls. They were nocturnal. And I was uh, not sleeping for like three and a half years of my life. And it's funny because during that time, all the songs that I wrote were about escaping, going, going away, getting on a train, getting on a plane, getting on a bus, <laughs> finding my way out of town. And um, so very interestingly enough, this is one of my favorite songs from that period. And I actually, I'll tell you guys, because you guys are probably all poets here, that um, I get my inspiration for songs not only from, uh, uh, you know, things that happen in my life, but definitely from movies, from television, from poetry, from television shows, from magazines. And this song actually was based on, I got the idea from Divine Secrets of the Yaya Sisterhood, <laughs> which I never actually even saw the movie, but I clicked onto it and saw a scene where um, Ashley Judd was on the phone and she's like, I don't want to go home. And she's in the, the motel with the cigarette and her hand is shaking. And I thought, okay, I'll write a song about getting out of town. And, uh, but I wanted to write a strong girl song about getting out of town. So this is it. Hmm. One, two, one, two, three, four. I did it again, didn't I? Forgot to turn off. Well, that's okay, because I forgot the first line of the song. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Ha <laughs> ha! I tiptoed out into the darkness Suitcase banging on my knee The neighbor's dog had started barking And my heart was beating faster than a hummingbird's wings Almost done, gotta get going. I sold your diamond down in Austin, just enough to get me by. Who needs to keep an empty promise when the Texas moon dangles like a pearl in the sky? Saying, come on. Girl, it's time to get gone Gotta get gone like a thunderbolt flying Gotta get gone like an angel takes wing Gotta get gone like a girl who is finding The woman she's been waiting to be Yeah, I gotta get gone hear the game on out here I can't smell the beer and I'm not there to put the blame on every time your mood is changing gear cuz it's my song and I gotta get gone gotta get gone like a scar that is fading gotta get gone like a shadow in light Gotta get gone to a life that is waiting Cause this one never fit me right Yeah, I gotta get gone Oh yeah Gotta get gone with the radio blasting And this time I ain't coming back Yeah, I gotta get gone Now I'm ten miles out of El Paso The gas tank's sinking down to E 
Roadmaps litter in the dashboard As I lay down road between my old life and me <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so this next song, um, I when I was five, um, I had this boy, my first boyfriend, and we used to go down to the pool. I had a pool, and uh, drape um, beach towels over the picnic table and play house, which, of course, he really didn't care about that, um, but I did. Uh, so I was the mother, and he was the father, and he would come home from work, and I would be cooking dinner. Ha, ha, ha. My poor husband. That never happens, does it? Um, and um, so his name was Andrew. Hold on, I'm just getting this A. Um, and which, but I couldn't say my R's, so his name was Dwu. <laughs> and, of course, I want to be, you know, close to reality and right from reality here, but I didn't think a song by the name of Dwu was really going to cut it. So this is a song called Andy. Hold on. Almost there. Oh, I did it. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> it's for you wherever you are, Andy. I don't know where you are. <laughs> Andy kissed me underneath the picnic table, two kids playing house in a world where grown-ups weren't allowed. Andy made me dizzy. fresh cut grass between our toes we held summer real close Andy will you press dandelions neath my chin and I'm remembering to watch the spill of raindrops soak our skin. Andy gave me an arrowhead he said was made of precious amethyst. Plus he gave me this, my first kiss. My first kiss Andy Will you press Andy Lyons Neath my chin And I'm remembering How we thrill To watch the spill Of raindrops Soak our skin So this last song, I, I just wrote this. So when I was in, uh, I, I'm from a farm in New Jersey. We had lots of animals, and we had a 200-year-old barn with horses and cows and chickens and ducks and guinea hens, actually. And um, when I was in first grade, uh, we were all in the living room of my house, and my dad looked out the window, and he's like, fire! And we ran out, and the barn was on fire. And it was, you know, 200-year-old wood that just went up like, like nobody's business. And um, my brother and my dad had to go in and take the, it was summer, and they had to take their t-shirts off and drape their t-shirts over the horse's eyes to get them out of the barn. And so, you know, obviously this was a pretty big event for us. And um, 
I wrote a song about it finally and, you know, applied it to a larger metaphor. So here it goes. <clears throat> So Charlotte, she's going to come up. Great. So wait, hold on for a minute. So um, uh, we've been talking about the connection between poetry and song. And David, do you want to say something about how this started? Yeah, well, and originally we had the idea of, of doing something about children, music, and poetry. 
and somehow that's what we had sort of planned for, and, uh, and somehow our wires got crossed here. And, and, and so in the meantime, what we were doing was we were looking for pumps from our kids. Uh, Charlotte is in the same gra grade as my son, Wilder, and they've been both great poets, by the way. Uh, and so we, we thought, well, we'll blend in some of the things that we were thinking about from the, the sort of the poetry show. And we wrote a song based on this poem that Charlotte's about to read. Um, was that enough to say about that? Yeah, that was good. So you going to read it? OK, get up, sit. Can read. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is Charlotte and Catania. Mm -hmm. Yes, say the title. It's the seashore. Waves crashing on the shore put a seashell to your ear. Hear the ocean again and again. Golden sand slips through your hand. The ocean seems like a never-ending puddle of blue glitter glue. The sand is hot but smooth as velvet. I feel. The I love to feel the silver breeze brushing softly on my face. Awesome. Yay. So we were looking through the most recent works of Charlotte Catania and chose that one <laughs> as the inspiration for a song <laughs> and sat down on the couch with uh, Wilder and Charlotte busying themselves around with the, the house coin with the coin the collection and things. And, and uh, we put this together for today. This time you're going to have to hear me naked on the guitar, which is Ooh, not great. Naked so. on the guitar? <laughs> well, I mean, there's Excuse nobody me. else covering up my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll do my best. I know it's bad, but that was the best I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like fear as a motivator. <laughs> I mean, the simplest chords in the world, and somehow my fingers won't do them. Um, so I wanted to we'll sort of shift into some more poetry stuff. And let me get this straight here. 
Um, you know, my festival sort of focuses on uh, the, the, the notion that, as Cheryl sort of pointed out, that the relationship between poetry and music, songwriting, has been, I feel, uh, sort of, well, they've been broken up for some time. Uh, and that this, the, the, my notion is that deep in us, there uh, really has never been that breakup. And in fact, you know, I'm trying to celebrate the fact that we're sort of, that we're very closely related. Um, and so I wanted to follow the path, if you don't mind, of a song that I wrote that was based on a poem that James Dickey wrote. Uh, that then I wrote a, song, a poem in response to, and then my dear friend Liam Rector wrote a song too. So I'm going to read a couple, read a poem, and I, I, I'll go back. There will be no test. I'll go back over that. <laughs> but but let, me, uh, let me start with this James Dickey poem. I don't know how familiar you are with Dickey's work. Um, Sadly, he, uh, I, uh, he's, to my mind, one of the great American poets and one of the most neglected uh, since his death uh, not too long ago, was it 10, 12 years? Uh, he's sort of been ignored. This poem struck me as sort of remarkable. I'm doing the right things, right? Where yeah. Are you? Okay. All right. So James Dickey. Uh, James Dickey, by the way, who had a spectacular 1945 Martin D18. Which is a kind of guitar, by the way. <laughs> and, and would carry it along with a bottle of whiskey wherever he would go to do readings. And <laughs> the results were not pretty sometimes. <laughs> but man, what a, what a poet. What a poet. The Leap. The only thing I have of Jane McNaughton is one instant of a dance, of a dancing class dance. She was the fastest runner in the seventh grade, my scrapbook says, even when the boys were beginning to be as big as the girls. But I do not have her running in my mind. Though Frances Lane is there, Frances Lane is there, Agnes Fraser, Fat Betty Lou Black, in the Boys Against Girls relays we ran at recess. She must have run like the other girls, with her skirts tucked up, so they would be like bloomers. But I cannot tell. That part of her is gone. What I do have is when she came with the hem of her skirt where it should be for a young lady into the annual dance of the dancing class we all hated and with a light grave leap jumped up and touched the, touched the end of one of the paper ring decorations to see if she could reach it. She could, and reached me now as well, hanging in my mind from a brown chain of brittle paper, thin and muscular, wide-mouthed, eager to prove whatever it proves when you leap in a new dress, a new womanhood, among the boys whom you easily left in the dust of the passionless playground. If I said I saw in the paper where Jane McNaughton Hill, mother of four, leaped to her death from a window of a downtown hotel, and that her body crushed in the top of a parked taxi, and that I held without trembling a picture of her lying, cra lying cradled in that papery steel as though lying in the grass, one shoe idly off, arms folded across her breast. I would not believe it myself. I would say the convenient thing, that it was a bad dream of maturity to see that eternal process, most obsessively wrong with the world, come out of her light, her earth's, earth spurning feet grown heavy. Would say that in the dusty heels of the playground, some boy who did not depend on speed of foot caught and betrayed her. Jane, stay where you are in my first mind. It was, an, uh, it was odd in that school at that dance. I and the other slow-footed yokels sat in corners cutting rings out of, the paper, of, out of drawing paper before you leaped in your new dress and touched the end of something I began, above the couple struggling on the floor, new men and women clutching at each other and prancing foolishly as bears. Hold on to that ring I made for you, Jane. My feet are nailed to the ground by dust I swallowed some 30 years ago while I examine my hands. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. yeah that's uh, certainly not one of his best known poems. And, and you know, he's, uh, he's got the, I'm from the South. I actually, when I was in, uh, uh, I went to the same college he did, I went to Vanderbilt. And when I was an uh, undergrad there, I wrote to him and sent him a bunch of poems, because he was a very famous poet. He, you know, he wrote, if you don't know, Deliverance, right? Do you know the, the, the book that the movie Deliverance is based on? He plays the sheriff at the end of it. He wrote that, he says, drunk in one night. Uh, um, and it made him famous and very rich. Uh, um, 
But I wrote him this letter as an undergrad, just like, you know, dear Mr. Dickey, blah, blah, blah. And he wrote this spectacularly beautiful letter to me. Uh, and we stayed in sort of phone contact and letter contact pretty much until he died. So, uh, but, but anyway, he, you know, he's, uh, he's got that sort of extraordinarily rich Southern thing going. So I wrote this song. Um, um, not directly from that poem, but it was, a, it was something that, that, that stayed with me. And it's called Fools of Time. And it has a few unfortunate similarities with the poem. Fools of Time. At 17, Mary placed her satin dress beside us on the table. And then she smiled at me, and we did the best that we were able. Back on the dance floor, she seemed to hang in the air like an angel. We were fools for love, making a fool of time. Soon I left town because I fell in love with leaving. And Mary married some boy she thought she could believe in. Back on the dance floor, who could have known what we were seeking? We were fools for love, now we're just fools of time. Last year Mary jumped from a hotel outside of Nashville. With her dress blown out, she must have seemed like an angel of disaster. Maybe now she knows the things that we were after. We were fools for love. Now we're just fools of time. We were fools for love. Now we're just fools of time. Um, I'm getting that weird handshake. I can't finger pick. Forgive me. Um, so weird. An otherwise completely confident human being. <laughs> That's absolutely not true. Um, so uh, um, th that song was a favorite song of my dear friend. Is really my best friend, uh, Liam Rector. If, I don't know if you know Liam. Uh, he was. Uh, uh, very well known in the poetry world. He, he's the person sort of responsible for the modern AWP, if you know what AWP is, those of you, it's Associated Writers and Writing Programs thing. Uh, he also created and, and developed the, the Bennington uh, Creative Writing Program. Um, and just sort of a very, very big figure. Well, he loved that song. Uh, and, and, but he was really mad at me because there were a couple of changes that, that we wanted forever for me to make. Little tiny things, which I actually made for that, that, that time. So it became sort of this thing that we had between us. This song that was based on a poem, and Liam's also, he's a Virginian, um, and, and when he died, he, he had written a poem for me that's in this last collection. He died uh, three years ago in August. Uh, suddenly, and, it's, and, and it's, uh, it seems like a relative. Then I'll, I'll read one little poem after that, and then we'll sing a couple. I'll sing a couple songs if I can. Um, Liam is also a really early supporter of sort of music and poetry stuff. For you, this is called Song Years. For years, I lived in a kind of wistful world where one foot was always out the door. Almost like a sailor, ready, anxious even, to decamp once more for the sea. And always the American highway and its great story calling, built by the American restless and all its subsequent moving. Loosely around the seasons I moved, looking for what I thought of as a natural life, and looked back at anyone who stayed put as if they had given up. 
given up something that should never be given up, ever. No sooner would I get someplace than I'd begin to check out the train schedules and other venues of departure. I hated the notion of insurance and never had any. I gave myself no place to fall. I thought of all this as keeping myself clean, keeping myself honest. It really wasn't a variant of the old high school locker room chant of find em, feel em, blank em, and forget em, I told myself, but sometimes, especially when I was packing, it surely felt that way. I was always leaving one, one for the next one. I wished them well and remained friends with most of them. I hoped a right one would come along for them, and they would be more ready for their, for their lasting lover, given the lessons, good and bad, we'd taught each other. Fall would come, and I'd head north for apple picking. Winter would find me holed up in Vermont for a moment, working on some chilly construction, and spring was always a sure-fired scamper south. Summer mostly meant going out west for, I suppose, hope. Change is slow, and hope is violent. I wanted to spe the speed and handling of a good sports car. I wanted things not as they should be, but things as they are. Most songs are sad, and most people do not want to live in song world. Except when some loved one leaves, or maybe over a drink, alone, at home, or perhaps in a car, ever more alone. Someone is always falling or being thrown. Most songs say, but one thing, my heart aches. And if you doubt this, listen to the songs. And tonight, let us all together send out our love to the songwriters for moving us. I moved this way until the cruelty of it overwhelmed me. Yeah, uh, Liam, truly great poet. Um, thanks, thanks. So I know you, you, the whole falling thing was, I mean, like I said, this dialogue between me and the song and the poem that I wrote, the other poem was going on for years. Uh, and this was sort of his final, right before he died, his final sort of, I'm going to get the last word, which he always would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but a sweet thing, and I think one of the things that, this, this sort of story, this thing sort of continues to unfold, is you know, I became friends with Roseanne Cash through, uh, through Wamfest and, and hang out with her. And she's, is she, like so many songwriters, and it's a weird thing, but so many songwriters really are interested in poetry and even serious poetry. And so I had gotten, hooked her up so that she would do a benefit reading for the Academy of American Poets. And then I suggested, I sent her Liam's poems and told her the story of this, this particular poem and, and uh, that song. And, uh, and she ended up reading that. Yeah, so Roseanne Cash is reading the poem based on my song, based on the other poem at the Academy of American Poets in memory of Liam. In a way. It's kind of, a, kind of a really, really, really sweet circle. Um, okay. Is it my head that's going in and out with reverb, or is it in fact happening? <laughs> okay. It's like every now and then it's like, it sounds like it turns up. So here's a poem. So the, the original James Dickey poem was called The Leap. Um, uh, all right, and, and at the same time that I wrote that song, exactly the same time, uh, I wrote a little poem called The Leap. Um, because, sort of as Liam is suggesting, you know, the songs tend to be really sad and they just tend to be about heartaches, but it's not just about that. There, there are better kinds of leaps than the ones that Liam took and that Mary took and that uh, all, all the others took. And this is one of those, I hope. Uh, and this is a song. I mean, a poem that was written to my younger son, who not that long ago, Charlotte, was your age, and now is 15 and going on dates, which I just can't fathom. Um, but this, this poem has a, has a, it's called The Leap, and it has a, an epigraph from Heraclitus, um, who inspires me all the time. Uh, to souls, it is death to become water. To water, it is death to become earth. From earth comes water, and from water, soul. The Leap. Our son stands at the dock's edge, eyeing his other self cast on the water below. Gulls scream, sun fires, fishes shadow the unbearable depths, and the self-song that calls him, calls him. Then his explosion, the glass shatter, the bottom of the leap. Um, there's something in that for me that was about this notion of sort of seeing that, that image in the water and, and the, the jump off is, not a, a, is, is a kind of destruction, but kind of a, just an embracing of the self that's there as well and sort of this, a step into another life 
that's richer. And, and so it, for me, it was something that counterbalanced this. You know, I always, I, I'm, I mean, Liam was talking specifically about me because all my songs are so darn sad. <laughs> and, and I'm a generally pretty chipper guy. <laughs> um, but, but this was a way of sort of, for me at least, of counterbalancing. And, and, and again, something, the, the, the interplay for me between poetry and songs is so constant that I can't, I really don't distinguish a whole lot uh, 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 between them. Um, the next thing. What are we doing time wise? All right, I'm going to try to play a song with you singing a teeny bit of harmony. Um, I just don't. If I, see, normally I could play this song, I could tell you about it. Yeah, but, but if I try to do that right now while singing, I'll have these claw like hands and I won't be able to do it. <laughs> But I wanted uh, something that's had a huge influence on me as a writer, both poetry and and as a songwriter, uh, were sort of Tin Pan Alley people and the people from the Brill Building, the great old songwriters of the past, the Fred Neils and the I mean, you could just there's a huge, huge list of them. And my my fantasy has always been I wanted to write for Nat King Cole, and I like those clever, beautiful love songs. Uh, that always had a little play, and I wrote one, and I, but I don't know that I can play it. So in the meantime, we'll play a sad one that I think I might be able to play. <laughs> the other one, the other. One. I'm just afraid that it would just be a disaster. I mean, a total disaster. Maybe I'll try it in a second Angel if you'll let disaster? me. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. So uh, just to talk about how the, uh, these uh, this sort of metamorphosis of stuff. Susan, after we first started talking about the songs, and she'd listen to that. I have, a, I have a total country, a Nashville version of that song I just sang. Uh, totally gussied up. It's hilariously bad. It sounds like you know the worst country music you can imagine. And, and, uh, and, and Susan heard it. And she said, well, why don't we write a song about? About in love with leaving. So that'll be so that now it'll be a poem that went to a song that went to a poem that went back to a song. Yeah. So yeah. Be our next set. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of what I do at Wamfest is trying to basically throw people together who do one thing or the other, and now I'm sort of actually getting people to write songs together. Uh, Bruce and Robert or Springsteen and Robert Pinsky, our former poet laureate, um, Paul Muldoon, who's many people consider the greatest English-speaking poet alive, uh, is written with my friend John Wesley Harding, and so it's, it's the idea of taking people, even songwriters who are known for writing great lyrics, are asked to then sort of collaborate, and it's not just setting something music; it's actually collaborating. It's been a really cool thing to watch unfold. When Dolly, Dolly, and. <laughs> This has not been secured yet, but oh, we shall I see. Say. No, I know we can say. I'm going to say it. Who cares? It's a. I, I'm, I'm pairing up Dolly Parton with the great poet Charles Wright. Now, if you don't know Charles Wright, he's he's this incredibly beautiful mystical poet who, coincidentally, is from Pickwick Dam, Tennessee, which is you know not yeah you know, it's probably 40 miles from where Dolly grew up in Sevierville, and I, I don't know how you feel about Dolly, but she's one of the greatest songwriters who's ever lived. She you know it's hard to see that sometimes for all the other stuff, but I think she's published something like 5,000 songs. Mm. Incredible, and many you know really tremendous. This has nothing to do with Dolly Parton, but it has to do with a night in Baltimore. Um, um, oh. Uh, there, 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 there's a guy in, in, in Baltimore, which is like my favorite bar city in the world. Um, the, I, was, I was out at this bar, and this, some of this stuff is actually sort of more or less true. Um, and there was, a, there, was a, <laughs> uh, there was a blind guy playing saxophone in this little bar. And, and I'm there with my girlfriend, and then the set's over, and everybody's sort of clearing out, and he takes off his glasses, and he wasn't blind. Oh, no. It was, I swear to God, <laughs> it was fantastic. I was like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I said, did we do that? Did we restore it? <laughs> you know, just, it was this totally sleazy place, too. Uh, and it may, not, it may sadly go, need to be annotated. There's a reference to a Marvin Gaye song, the great, great Marvin Gaye, uh, and, and a wonderful song of his called Let's Get It On, if you know that. Do you know that? <clears throat> Which is the song also sounds absolutely nothing like okay. Baltimore on a rainy night. The wind and the rain drove us to a bar again that night. 
Where Debbie licked the pool cue and stirred the Phil's Point boys to fight. While Frankie and Carla drank to those lovers of delight. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. The blind man on the saxophone, he blew the last call song. Then he took off his glasses, laughed and said, what you see is sometimes wrong. And it doesn't take a blind man to see this won't last long. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. Frankie sang with Marvin, Carla beat the wheel and sang along. In the back seat, Deb pulled a dress up, laid back and laughed, let's get it on. The headlights on the rainy glass danced to that sweetest song. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. We all fell back apart about a year from that night. Deb works for dad now, I've got kids, we're all all right. Maybe Frankie and Carla still drink to those lovers of delight. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. It was Baltimore on a rainy night. <laughs> okay. So, that's kind of all we had on the schedule, except for talking about WAMFest, if you want to talk about WAMFest stuff. Um, I think Cheryl did a wonderful job of, of describing what it's been about. Uh, I had the idea about four years ago. Uh, I teach down in New Jersey, Fairleigh Dickinson University, which is 253 and a half miles from my house. Uh, and I drive down there for How two days a week. It's 253.5. Uh, uh, each way, every week, for 32 weeks. Um, uh, but I went down there. I had the opportunity to, to start a creative writing program essentially from scratch. And I had all these ideas from the, that had built up after many years of being at Emerson and seeing the whole thing done terribly wrong. Uh, and so I went there, and, and it's just been this wonderful thing. So I had this idea because I grew up around songwriters. And basically everybody I grew up with in Tennessee is in the music business somewhere or another. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course I've been in fancy poetry world all of my adult life. And it was funny because it, it turned out that, you know, all of my, the, the, about the only place in America where poets are respected by normal people is in Nashville, Tennessee. And partly that's because they think they can make money off of you by hel you helping them out with songs. But it's really true. It's a place where the, the, the written word has a tremendous amount of respect. Uh, at the same time, you know, all of my poet friends uh, sort of wish that they were rock stars. And that's a very, very common thing. Uh, and, and so I thought, you know, and these are very dear friends of mine. I was at both ends of these fields that are sort of, and I, and I said, well, let's just bring them all together and let's just talk and see what happens. And for me, it really becomes kind of a class issue. Someone who's spent most of my adult life in the university, uh, where you see this sort of hierarchy of, of, you know, what studied. Well, what studied is, you know, the stuff that, that I mean, it, no, nobody studies songs unless it's Robert Burns or maybe Barbara Allen. Something that has been codified, something that's been put in the anthologies. Uh, but, and at the same time, you have kids growing up and thinking, where are they getting their primary sort of inspiration for the arts? What's well, coming from music or it's coming from the movies or it's coming from something around them? And, and what was very troubling for me in terms of our educational system is that what do you do? You know, what, how do you solve this problem of kids having these tremendously inspiring inspirations 
and not finding a hookup with those in school. Instead, they sort of have something else to, well, this is poetry, and this is this, and this is great. And so the goal of this, in a way, is to try to, to change that a little bit so that, so, that, so that contemporary songs, or relatively contemporary songs, can be considered not as poetry necessarily, but simply as writing that's worth studying seriously in order to sort of support the enthusiasm of young people who have that enthusiasm as opposed to them having to keep it kind of in a closet, you know, so that they're, they're sort of uh, off someplace, you know, playing, singing their, singing their songs to the, the, the you know, however trashy in, in some room someplace, unable to sort of celebrate it as a real part of the rich culture in which they live and which, you know, they are going to participate in as they grow up. So that's, in a, in a nutshell, kind of what I was up to. So I started asking people, and everybody wanted to come. Uh, and, and it's just been a fantastic thing to watch unfold. And now it's been, it's not just songwriters and poets, now it's also filmmakers and, and uh, uh, critics like Dave Marsh has become a very good friend. Uh, Dave's one of the uh, founders of the, of the country, the, the country, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, and a longtime editor at Rolling Stone. And so I sort of, you know, you end up in this bringing up people, anybody who sort of took a creative passion and shaped it into a form that was, you know, that they could carry into the world, you know, and, and live with. And so that's sort of been the goal. And now, you know, this last time it was, you know, this dream. I, I started working on getting Springsteen to come to this thing more than two years ago. Uh, and this incredibly elaborate sort of courtship, uh, and and then I knew that Robert Pinsky, who's the, the great the great poet and. and by far, to my mind, the greatest poet laureate we've had in terms of actually promoting poetry among the people. I knew that he was felt like I did about some of the class issues involved, and that we needed to break down these barriers. Uh, and so he jumped on board, and then that happened back in May, which was a, a, a mind-blowingly beautiful event. Everybody thought that it was sort of a, you know, publicity stunt. But what happens is when you get somebody like Bruce Springsteen on stage with somebody like Robert Pinsky, is they they were born in the same hospital, by the way, which I think is hilarious. Uh, uh, Ten years apart. <laughs> Is that even I don't think Robert took it real seriously until until he met, and all of a sudden everything just became two people, serious artists having a discussion. It was amazing, and they were composing on stage. Uh, Bruce was playing to Robert's songs, and they were they were just sort of, you know just sort of doing all these improvisings around them. Bruce played. So we didn't know what Bruce was going to do, and he showed up and played like six of his greatest hits acoustically, and talked about their creative process and the process of being an artist growing older. And the two of them have become like best buddies. It's a beautiful beautiful thing uh, and so I think what people recognize thanks you, know, you take sometimes the getting the famous people to to get attention for you but but that's what I sort of knew all along is if you get these people together and they're serious about what they do that there's really a lot that they have in common um, and you know, does, I don't does anybody have any questions about that we have another, another couple minutes or any thoughts Well, it, the, the, the where is in Madison, New Jersey, on the campus of Fairleigh Dickinson University, 200, I'd say approximately 220 miles from where we sit. Um, <laughs> um, he knows. Um, so, uh, something like that. So yeah, and when it, when it happens is, they're sort of scattered around, but more and more we're putting them together. We had John Doe and Xine of the greatest rock and roll band of all time, X. Uh, and uh, a bunch of comedians, which is something else I've brought in recently because I think that they're using language in this really wonderful way. Uh, and then Paul Muldoon and John Wesley Harding. What I, had, what I asked them to do is to write songs together, and I'm putting out an album of these poet-songwriter collaborations, and, and Paul and, and Wes, was the, that was the first one. So th those, those, and then Bruce happened with, with Robert. Those were four days in a row in May, and that's probably what we'll shoot for. But, it, but because we have no money, we're sort of the slave to people's schedules, and when you get these fancy folks, they have you know, people offering them lots of money to do things, and, and as kind as they are, they're not going to turn down these $100,000 gigs or whatever to come play for my 200 people. Um, other things? Well, I don't know what it's going to be next year. We're still working on it, but generally it's going to be in the spring. Sorry. Is there a website? There is a, we a website. It's whamfest.com. Mm -hmm. It's kind of chintzy because I did it. What? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's W A. It's the Words and Music Festival. So, W A M Fest. I'm sorry. I should have made it clear. Yeah, yeah. And come down. It'd be really great to have people come visit. And it's also cool because we get the. It's not just you know. It's not just my students, and it's not just the faculty and staff, but it draws on the community. So that's the other barrier that's trying to be broken down is just to sort of have more interaction between the academy and the town in the gown, as they say. The Town of the Gats, a very, well, a song title. very, very well known. We'll be ready later. <laughs> Stay around now. <laughs> I, 
It, it was really wonderful, both of them I, I, talking about this. And, and Bruce is, Bruce said that, that he has, it feels like he just doesn't need as many words anymore. Uh, that, you know, he started off and he made a joke. He went through uh, like 10th Avenue Freeze Out or one of those early songs where it's just like, you know, like 400 words in the first you know, eight measures that he's blasting in there. And he said that he just feels like that now there's, you know, that he really has that what he has to say is much more austere, you know, that, that it's down to few, much fewer words. Um, and he talked a lot about sort of, you know, growing older as an artist and sort of, you know, re, sort of, you know, th that this is his nourishment and he continues to grow through it. Uh, um, and it's, he, he made the joke quote at it that he said, well, I'm immortal. So he's not really thinking about death in the way that Robert Pinsky had talked more specifically about needing to sort of get a, a career up. But, but he, uh, um, and I don't think he thinks about it too much. I think he really, and part of, part of the beauty of Bruce is this sort of continuous unfolding of a self over time as an artist. Very few artists continue to be, you know, productive and, and richly innovative uh, throughout their careers. And he has, and I think, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, and he sort of talked about that a little bit. Sure. <laughs> it's 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 so uh, okay, it's, it's happened. Roseanne Cash came last year along with a bunch of other people. Uh, the students were, you know, they the ones who came were blown away because if you don't know Roseanne, she's unbelievably great, right? You know, she incredible voice, incredible person. Uh, um, so they were just blown away, and that's what the other thing is, 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 is sort of breaking down the barriers between fancy people and people in school because the people are super nice. You know, they're really open and loving towards the students. So that's a, they, the students were just blown away by that. But it was only a handful of them this year because the spring scene. And again, you know, people sort of give me a hard time about trying to get these super famous people. But I knew that, not to sound like I know too much, I don't, but, but I knew that it would take that to get the students involved. And sure enough, this, it exploded in the student body. And they were incredibly proud of this, you know, of the fact that Bruce had never done anything remotely like this in his career. Um, he'd never been to a university and doing this kind of setting. And so the, the, the students at, at FDU, which is primarily sort of a working class college, uh, um, were extremely, extremely proud. Uh, so it's been fantastic. And now I'm looking forward to seeing just, how, you know, and um, who knows uh, how much it's going to carry over into next year. Uh, but more and more they, they want to be involved. Now it's been a, you know, my whole plan was kind of to build something and then try to slowly let it go to the students where they would have more control over it uh, rather than to be something that's run from yet another parent figure or something. Uh, and I, that is happening. And now they're going, to, they're going to pick, they're going to give me a short list of the people, the famous people they want me to bring. Uh, so it'll be, they're going to do a contest and say, that's uh, kind of a scary prospect. And, I don't know if Lady, Lady, Lady Gaga is going to be in her school, <laughs> but we'll do it if we have to. Anything else? Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. Should, do, should I try to sing this one last song? Do we have time, Susan, uh, Cheryl? Or are we done? No time. We don't have time. <laughs> it's a wedding song. It's really sweet. Trust me, you can listen to it someday. <laughs> thank you all so much for having us. And now I'd like to invite up singer-songwriter Perry Desmond Davies. Help me welcome her up.
You'd be first on the list And though it could take years to catch up I know that you would wait With the patience of a saint I bet you didn't know That I want the world for you I miss the good times And still curse the bad So faded yet so easily recalled If I try So I don't try 
And now we have coming from Framingham, Linda Havel to share some poetry. Help me welcome Linda. Thank you. I took myself last week for a silent retreat time um, just to help me learn and repeat a kind of loving kindness because I have a little trouble with lately. I, uh, my tolerance goes down for noise in, around uh, my home. So I would just like to read this one little poem that I wrote called A Frenzy in the Neighborhood still being worked. Worthy efforts create annoying sounds. Yards need lawnmowers, tree branches, chainsaws, mufflers vent in driveways where peeling houses are sanded. Everywhere there are people with to-do lists. They rise early on my street, hauling around leaf blowers, mulches, and electric trimmers. I attempt to prioritize my most critical tasks, like choosing a, a space to do yoga, easing agitation. If I find antidotes for sloth and torpor, I'll get inspired to snip the dried heads off my daffodils. Thank you. On our open mic list today, we have Mary Pratt, who comes from Holliston, and she is here to share a lovely song of preview of summer for us. So please help me welcome Mary Pratt up. Hot hey. 
Thank you, Mary. With that beautiful song, I am officially ready for summer now. <laughs> well, that concludes our last program of this fourth season. And I want to thank you all very much. Uh, you might have the idea that I do love this venue, love hosting every bit of it the last four years. So I'm going to play an original. Uh, this song is called Why Can't You. It's off of my new CD. I have them here today if anybody's interested. Okay, hope you enjoy it. Where have you been all my life? Now I saw you, I can't get you off my mind. He walks past without a second glance And I think of that Maybe he'll give me a chance Thank you, Ashley, and um, 
As I always encourage you to mention, we have a back table for all people who come to open mic or uh, otherwise. If you have any CDs or books to share, to please put over there and take a look. And I know Ashley has a new one, uh, which is wonderful. When we protect her beauty, there is honor. A piece of freestyle prose that I came up with recently entitled Bliss. Doorknob sign already flipped over from do not disturb to welcome to the funny farm. Knock, knock, knock. Tap, tap, tap. No peeking through the peek hole. Open for bearer of soul food, flowers, herbs, spice, surprises, readily immersed in the moment. A soft skin, fun living face, eyes lined with crescent moons that make me toss back my head to howl. Ah, uh, oh, hug, 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 laugh, laugh, laugh. No worries, no wondering if soaring with eagles is possible. Imperfections, but just the right fit. Dialogue propels sacred spirit connections. Laughter nourishes a well of being. Touch weaves a tapestry of softer hues. Doorknob signed is being flipped over from welcome to the funny farm to do not disturb. Thank you. And thank you, PJ. And now coming from Harvard, Massachusetts, we have Ashley Jordan, singer-songwriter, to share a song, so help me welcome Ashley. Thank you, Heather. Now coming from Natick, we have Russell Kramer to share a poem with us this morning. Russell, please welcome Russell up here. Hello there. It's uh, inspiring to be here. I'm thankful for all the performers. I've played an instrument and a piano for years, and I've wrote poetry for years, and their inspiration and how to put them together is just uh, continually motivating me. This is called Rainbow Spirit. And ask yourself where in your life you see rainbows. Oh, rainbow spirit, arching through the sky, from deep red to misty violet, spanning all the spectrum we can see, the sun and rain together bring life to earth, letting you be seen. From gray clouds you emerge, blue sky, white light you bring. Wisdom within you, it is said, speckles of which we glean. From the symphony of nature, hear the bird's sacred song and their fluttering wings. Soaring upon your arch so bold, we journey in search of meaning attaining insight, bumbling our way as we mere humans do. A motley race we are, with no obvious direction. From violent wars and indifference to fellow man and Mother Earth, to compassion, loving tender, to contemplation, prayer, cosmic communion, and inner reflection. 
We are a living rainbow, it appears, from poise and confidence, trust and bonding, resounding faith, to darkness in our depths, our innermost fears. Longing to express our spirits throughout our checkered history, we gaze up to the sky and marvel at your colored arch so majestic. Elusive, not knowing where you begin or where you end, a mystery yet to unfold. O rainbow spirit, you free us from our burden so heavy, arousing our inner alchemy. Transformation is upon us, and you turn our lead into a pot of gold. Thank you. And please. Since it's June, the month of Father's Day, I'm going to veer from my usual style uh, and read a sentimental piece. Um, as one of my mentors said, feeling the way that I do about uh, my dad and the times we had, how could it be anything else but sentimental? Coffee with Dad. It's nice, at least, you have a few here. I still remember my favorites. Did you know Blanche's Stevie can name them all by sight? I used to hug them while their sandpaper hide tugged at me as I moved up to perch safely in my cloister until ready to reach out on my own and explore the maze of angles overhead. The scratchiest one was beside the stone wall in front of the hayfield. I would inch out on a limb, balancing without a backward glance, then swing and drop to the ground, proving my grit to the neighborhood boys. Did I tell you they never dared follow? The tallest one was next door in the yard of the retirement home. I could sway fearless at the top without toppling. I loved them for their constancy, creating fantasy in winter, sharing their gifts in spring, whispering comfort in summer, providing color with the cologne of autumn, Hey, remember riding in the car, serenading us with a recital of your favorite Joyce Kilmer poem? Leaning back against his granite, newly cut blades tickling at my skin, I drain my cup, looking up into the evergreen shade, entertained by the fluttering guests, longing for the hugging of child life. A week ago, I was sitting around minding my own business, and I felt this song in the air, kind of like a breeze. And I sat down and I started playing my guitar, and I got the whole song in about an hour, which is really rare for me. It takes me decades usually to get the whole thing, and so I got it in about an hour. And it was one of those things where you you're kind of walking in a cave in the dark and all of a sudden you run into a big spider web and it just kind of grabs you and holds you. And then the universe kind of says, well, now that I have your attention, and you just listened and there was the whole song. And first I didn't really want to get involved with it because I thought it was kind of preachy and fatalistic, but I stuck with it. And, and then I, uh, what really cemented the deal for me was a couple of days after I wrote it, there were two PBS specials on. Uh, one of them was on um, Pompeii. I don't know if any of you saw that. And Pompeii was uh, where everybody thought they'd be safe if they stayed in their houses. And surprise, they found that not to be true. And the other one was about the building of the Colosseum. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. 
So this is a song called um, Down Wall Street Way. He poured hot steel for 20 years in the factory. Sacrificed in his life for his wife and his family. Now his son's on Wall Street, pulling tigers by the tail. Taking bets, his father's company bellies up and fails. And soon Cher will be singing there and will eat at the buffet. Pawn shops will open, tall fountains spray. Grizzlies fighting wild bulls down Wall Street way. As we cheer in the Coliseum, watching Rome decay. Covered wagons rolling, California or bus. Stranded in the desert by the Las Vegas dust. Couldn't grow an ear of corn or log a single tree. Build a city for the gambling man, but it slipped down to Wall Street. And soon Cher will be singing there and we'll eat at the buffet. Pawn shops will open, tall fountains spray. Grizzlies fighting wild bulls down Wall Street way. As we cheer in the Coliseum, watching Rome decay. In the land of milk and honey, we have gone insane. To think wealth is only money and health means there's no pain. But we're all in the same wagon, yet no one wants to say. If we don't get out and push this thing, well, there'll be hell to pay. And the story never ends. Here we go again. Cities rise and fall Can you hear the call? There appears to be writing on the wall Where will you be when the building falls? If you won't go through the fire in the hall What's a man with his hands labored all the day? Shipped his products overseas, American made. Now we sit and watch TV and let others toil our fields. Skating on this razor's edge, this cut may never heal. And soon Cher will be singing there, we'll eat at the buffet. On shops will open. Tall fountain spray, grizzlies fighting wild bulls down Wall Street way. As we cheer in the Coliseum, watching Rome decay. And we'll be singing our final hooray. If we keep thinking, someone else will save the day. Save the day. Thank you. And thank you, Mike. Now coming from Needham is PJ Carr here to share some poetry with us. So please say good morning to PJ.
And, um, so wonderful morning of features, uh, and uh, I'm very grateful. It's been uh, such a great year here and uh, a terrific finale. And um, I would like to say uh, thank you again to features Peter Lagoy and David Daniel and Susan Catanio. And I would like to take this time to say thank you to the crew here yes. also for the whole year. Yeah. All the sound help and uh, Mike Tarosian and uh, uh, who is uh, signing off for this year and we're moving on to uh, Don and uh, we're starting again in October and it will be the third Saturday once again. I would like to say thank you for all of you for coming out here as audience today as well. Um, I love hosting this uh, and it can't happen like it does uh, unless all of you come here and it's been a wonderful community this year so thank you once again for being here all this year. An important part of this community also is the open mic and that's what we're getting to now. We do have a terrific lineup. I'll read the list to you at this point and we'll see uh, who's here and not. I'd like to ask the favor since we do have a big lineup um, that we can move along as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, if you can please uh, stick to three to four minutes today in the sharing of your song and poem. Um, and we're beginning with Jim Scott, Chris Gerstner, Perry Desmond Davies, Linda Havel, John McAuliffe, Heather DuPont, Russell Kramer, Joe Fredette, is Joe here? Okay. Kathy Taylor, Judith Christensen, John Mylott, Mike Dakota, John Gerard, John, are you here? I didn't see him. Okay, PJ Carr, Ashley Jordan, Ruth Ann Baylor, Kathy Munier, Michelle Boulay, Michelle, are you here? Okay. Rich Albert, Suzanne Owens, Songi, John Bamer, and Terrence Hegarty and Mary Pratt. So we'll see how it goes. And uh, we're going to get started at this point. Yes? I signed yes. up. B. Yes. B. Oh, you signed up for open mic? OK. Uh, I misunderstood your sign up. BG? B. Barbara John. Barbara John. OK. All right. Uh, I apologize for misunderstanding. So I'll put you on there for one of the uh, absent ones. So uh, we're going to start now with Jim Scott, who comes from Shrewsbury. So he's here for the first time. Help me welcome him up here, Jim Scott. I'd like to sneak up for a minute first and say, um, I ask you to join me in thanking Cheryl for putting this on. It's been a wonderful program. Nice to be here. Thanks for <clears throat> doing this for uh, poetry and for music. I'm still undecided. I got it down to one of two songs. I still can't really quite think which one it should be. I think it'll be this uh, song that borrows a chorus from a, from a Russian, of Russian derivation. I was just going to fix the words and I ended up getting carried away in a rush of irrational exuberance, added two verses. And it starts out with a goodbye wish, but uh, don't leave. My wish for you, as now we part, is for greater peace to fill your heart with dreams as vast as starry space. So hurt and anger know no place. May truth be shared and wounds be healed, and joy for living be revealed. Through every fate and circumstance, may hope lead weary steps to death. Oh 
to be part three or part four. And may your life be as a song resound. And may your life be sing awake the light. Then softly serenade the stars ever dancing circles in the night. to share a song. Chris, where are you from? I'm, I'm from Needham. Needham, all right. Uh, sure. I grew up in choir singing. You know, I just, uh, standing to sing or be at school works better for me. Plus, I'm short. <laughs> okay, uh, welcome Chris. Thank you very much. That. Um, I usually like to sing new songs uh, at open mics, but um, I found a song I wrote some years back and I've been wanting to uh, share it more. So I wrote this um, after being separated from my ex-husband and uh, had a vivid dream one night and here's the song that I wrote afterwards. Happy he 
comes a running to me. It feels like the old times coming home from the store, but it's not my home anymore. It's not my home. And now I'd like to invite up singer-songwriter Perry Desmond Davies. Help me welcome her up. I don't see a plug in here anywhere, so I don't know what we're going to do about that. Just 
Uh, not sure. I guess I can get by. You hear that? I'm originally from Detroit. I moved to Massachusetts on December 30th, 1970. Been here ever since with a lot of excursions to different parts of the country. Uh, I have a special fondness for the state of Tennessee. Um, I love American music. I love its history. And I found more of it in Tennessee than I did in any other state in the Union. Uh, and with all apologies to Nashville, my favorite city down there because of its history and its food and the people is Memphis. And this is a song about Memphis called, strangely enough, I Gotta Get Back to Memphis. John McAuliffe. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce Heather DuPont. Uh, Heather comes from Lowell and has some poetry to share. Help me welcome her up here. Uh, back again from Upton, poet Kathy Taylor. Please help me welcome Kathy up here. Uh, 
Okay, I have a... It's okay? Okay, I have a short poem today. Um, I wrote this in 2002. I took a trip um, to South Carolina. At, it was at a beach house with my two girls. And um, it, was, it, was, it was in April, and it was like the 4th of July. It was really hot. It was really beautiful. But I noticed that the ocean, there were all these um, soapy bubbles everywhere. And I kept asking people, look at those soapy bubbles. And people just seemed to ignore it. Um, I wrote this poem then, and I brought it out today with um, prayers and thoughts, of course, for our Gulf Coast. It's called Ancient Sea. Ancient Sea, littered beach of shattered shells like shards of pottery from antiquity. Ancient Sea, tumble of surf crashing down to the ground, crescendo of waves pounding, astounding, ancient sea. Sharks and jellyfish very much alive, not extinct, but distinctly here. Their instinct for survival intact, in fact. No need to evolve or change. Strange ancient sea. And thank you, Kathy. And now here with Dobro is Judith Christensen to share a song. And Judith, you come from Wayland, is that correct? Concord. Concord, close. <laughs> All right, please help me welcome Judith up here. Okay, so I can't hear myself, but you guys can hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. This song uh, originally started as a Victorian, a mother's last words to her daughter. And there's 20 verses about, dear daughter, don't play cards or go partying anymore. And it's really grim, but I love the song. And um, the Whale and Jennies out of Canada recorded this version. I don't know who wrote it but it's um, Unitarianized.
that no bro. And the song was wonderful. And now we have a little open mic feedback. Thank you. And we have John Milot coming here from Southborough to share a poem. So please help me say hello to John this morning. This is the time of year when New Englanders fire up the grill for family cookouts and barbecues. So with that in mind, today I want to take you down to Texas, the heart of barbecue country, for my poem, A Savory Haze Over Houston. Texans live and breathe barbecue, grilling chicken, steak, and ribs, served with drinks, slaw, and salad. Two folks in t-shirts, tuxes, and bibs. The state holds over 400 barbecue contests each year. And Texans love their barbecue with a frosty Longhorn beer. Now, research scientists at Venerable Rice U say the smog over Houston contains meat particles, too. Tiny bits of fatty meat acids float into the air from the grill, mixing with dust and diesel fumes, clogging lungs, and making people ill. On hearing this news, the Gulf Coast Barbecue Association said they were blown away, but gave no further explanation. So, if you're in Houston and want to know the weather, sweetie, don't be surprised to hear today's forecast is partly meaty. Thank you very much. Okay, I am not hungry now. <laughs> Thank you, John. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Dakota, who comes from Franklin and has a song to share. Help me welcome Mike. So, Ashley Jordan, and we're moving on to Ruth Ann Baylor now, who has her guitar in the back, and she comes from Holliston, and she has a song for us this morning. So please help me welcome on down Ruth Ann Baylor. <laughs> I grew up on a chicken farm, and uh, not as romantic, um, all 90,000 of them. Not very romantic in August, but um, anyway, this song is about my hometown, and I grew up in the Catskills, and it's called Country Night.
Thank you. And thank you, Ruth Ann. Now I'd like to introduce, coming from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, is Kathy Munier to share poetry. Help me welcome Kathy. Hello, everyone. Uh, the, the poem that I uh, chose to read today was inspired by an ordinary day where I had three extraordinary kindnesses showed to me. And the title is Kindness. Within us all, there is a place. We hear the call to show God's grace. Do you listen when given the time, or are you missing the chance to be kind? What kind are you as God shows you the sign? What will you do? Choose to be kind. Will you turn away from the stranger? Your act just may keep them from danger. The danger may be your choice to be blind, deciding not to see your chance to be kind. Through loving, this loving act, showing that you care while receiving love back, making all aware. The gift of kindness when freely given, its joy is timeless as angels smile in heaven. Knowing you did not miss your chance to be kind, experiencing bliss, connecting with the divine. Thank you. Thank you for words of kindness, Kathy. And we have uh, three more for our open mic for the season. And uh, I'm, I'm feeling sad and mm -hmm. a little, uh, I don't know, uh, not happy, but uh, maybe relief because I'm getting, uh, it's not quite burnout, but it's a little like smoldering of hosting of events, and I'm barely able to say sensible words anymore, so thank you for your patience. Um, but uh, yeah, what I did want to say is that because we break until October, um, if anyone has some uh, gigs or venues over the summer you'd like me to announce for the next few weeks, I can do that with the email list. Uh, just let me know, send me an email for that, so I'll let you know what else is going on in the summer. But, uh, you know, I do love this thing of four years now, and thank you for all for being here uh, late today, too, so that we could celebrate everyone who wanted to get on open mic. And, uh, of course, to our crew for staying later, too. All right, three more to go with happiness and sadness. <laughs> I have Suzanne Owens next on the list, who is a poet coming from Littleton. So please help me say good afternoon to Suzanne Owens. Good afternoon, Cheryl and everybody. It's certainly worth it. Um, you're all parents, there's quite a lot of you probably, but my son has gone to the Netherlands for four years to work in a lab there on neuroscience and get his PhD. And it's hard to say goodbye to somebody going so far away who you love so much. And so this came out of, uh, out of uh, his absence. And it's called In the Netherlands, Skype 210. You all know what Skype is, right? I didn't until this happened. Even though my grandmother's handwriting talked to my mother like a work of art, and those letters were as long as a book, she couldn't see, hear, or hold her daughter in her arms. Then on wires roped around the world, I conversed with my sister from England, and we exchanged news while she watched her children play. But. I couldn't embrace her. Suddenly, those wires vanished, and now my daughter gossips with her husband from the car in stores while walking with their baby through the streets, but he can't hold their hands. In this world, miracles happen. 
Now I can see the pain in your eyes as we talk. My dearest son in Rotterdam and me in Massachusetts. You can see my eyes widen in disbelief. I can almost smell the beer in the can, taste your tears falling onto it. I can hear your voice, your sobs, but I can't hold you in my arms. My body can't share your pain, your shock and regret. You were children together, like brothers, in high school and college, in soccer on skis, and with horses in barns. Now he is gone, and I can't hold you in my arms. While weeping, you tell me how, before he tied the rope around his neck with his own hands, then dangled in air, he left you and his friends a message in, on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Now I'd like to welcome Sangi, who comes from Natick and has poetry sometimes, songs sometimes. We'll see what she has for us this morning. Sangi, come on down. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to share both, actually. Um, anyhow, many reasons to write and speak out. I was told not to speak in English, but that is the reason I'm writing and speaking. And even a couple months ago, someone well-meaning pe person told me, no average American will understand your accent. Give up. But here I am. So, and thank you, Cheryl and HCM, uh, this opportunity to share this. The first one called Odd Things. Early morning, air still dipped, tinted deep blue. When the sun hadn't lifted his eyes yet, crackling cricket bravely, breaking the silence, bellowing bellies, letting the world know their existence. Why must I shut my mind, silence my voice, to be accepted as normal? I was actually turned my mind on and told me that I, I, I was giving medicine. I took that medicine. I couldn't even walk. Two years I lived a zombie or human vegetable life. That was nine years ago. Since, seven, and since then, I started walking when I walk somehow is teaching me English. So this next one I call mind skip, but within us, we have all this kind of thing, turning on mind. So I will sing that one for you. Sun rise, sunset, starlight sailing with the moon. Underneath the between the sparks of bright and dim light. Some grow weak, some grow lozus, some grow leopardier, some grow love or hate, life dances, Walling, twirling, ups and down, blessing of heavenly light with cosmic wind. Thank you. And thank you, Sami. 
and last. And it's been a wonderful season. Uh, take a look. You'll see uh, all the past shows online from this season and the one before. And I, I will get the word out on um, uh, names, uh, who's on what show as well. Um, that's my next project. I want to thank you all for uh, all that you bring and contribute here uh, as audience, open mic participants, as features, uh, as, all as thank a wonderful Cheryl. community. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And I want to thank the HCAM crew here who makes this possible. We can have a venue. Mike Tarosh and Don Cronin, Maureen Bumuller, thank you so much. So even though we won't be here this summer, you can go take a look online at the HCAM website, grab a card if you don't have it, tell your friends all over the world to come and take a look at what's been happening. And send me your news and I can share that on the open mic, I mean on the email list to the end of the month. Um, ready for summer. Uh, back in October, third Saturday, we have uh, poet January, January Jill O'Neill, and we have Bethel Steele, singer-songwriter, and we have singer-songwriter Ashley Jordan. So I hope to see you all the third Saturday of October, and wish you all a wonderful summer, and I thank you so much again. <laughs>
our innermost fears. Longing to express our spirits throughout our checkered history, we gaze up to the sky and marvel at your colored arch so majestic. Elusive, not knowing where you begin or where you end. A mystery yet to unfold. O oh, rainbow spirit, you free us from our burdens so heavy, arousing our inner alchemy. Transformation is upon us, and you turn our lead into a pot of gold. Thank you. And thank you, Russell. And now I'd like to introduce for the first time Barbara Johnson here to share some words and perhaps a little song with us. Help me welcome Barbara. And where are you from? Harwich. Harwich Cape on Cape Cod. Hello. Uh, recently I took a pilgrimage to Greece and um, I have a short poem and a short song. The poem comes from visiting the mysteries of Eleusis. I was at the entrance to the cave of the underworld where supposedly Persephone was abducted. This is called Plutonian Cavern and a message to me. Take the cave with you, take the mage with you, Hades leads you through every ending, Demeter weaves you into every beginning, Persephone dances you with every circling, hand in hand in hand. The song poem I composed uh, 30 years ago when I went to visit the jewel of all jewels of islands off of Greece called Sifnos, and um, I wanted to go to the beach, but my inn, this little place I was staying, is at the top of Sifnos. I missed the bus, it was a three hour walk to the shoreline, and I was scorched when I got to the bottom, but I also had written a poem. Sifnos means I love you. Sifno saga po, Sifno saga po, how is it you call to the day when others never know this play? How is it you hold in your heart the stars and the sun of which we are part? How is it you lend your land to the sea and know it a blend of eternity? Sifnos Sagapo, Sifnos Sagapo, and what is your quest or is there none at all? A dream that is gotten has only to fall. And what is your memory? Is it rich of the old? Or a gift to the present forever untold? And what is your secret? Can it be shared? Is it too much of laughter? Too much of prayer? Sifnos Sagapo Sifnos Sagapo What? Oh. And thank you, Barbara. Now I'd like to introduce...